Please help me in welcoming to the stage Dan Lyons. Thank you, Brian. Hey, I think, uh, I, I, I think you and I are the only guys in this entire audience wearing blue suits, ties, and white shirts. Because you up? told me you were going to wear jeans <laughs> and I should wear a suit, and now, I'm, now I look like you. But I think, I think yeah. it's really distinguished. I think you look great. We're, and, we're keeping up the standards. Right? Yeah, you've yeah. been asking me a lot of questions. You have a lot of, a lot of really interesting insights yeah, yeah. about this community, but I think you're here as much to learn as to talk about so, and that's true for all of us, so. Oh, totally, you know, I, I was thinking when you just, when you're introducing me and talking about all the questions I asked, that's what, I have 13 year old twins, and that's the most embarrassing thing. They, they say that that's how I embarrass them, because everybody I meet, I just start, I go into reporter mode, I just start asking questions. It's, it's yeah. like second nature to me now, but, yeah. but yeah, I'm super interested in this. All right, well, these guys all want to hear your insights as well. Well, so I hope I have something good to say, okay. Dan Lyons, everybody. Okay. Thanks, Brian, thank you very much. Hi, guys. Um, so um, I am really, really excited to be here, and I want to thank you all for, for coming uh, for what I've been told is the Woodstock of Unmanned Vehicle Systems International uh, Conferences. Um, you know this, this quote about, uh, yeah, the brown acid, just watch out, it's, we've had bad warnings about it, but the, uh, you know this quote. Um, and this place, to me, as a layperson, has more magical stuff than probably anywhere else on earth, right? I, with a caveat, which is that I studied liberal arts in college, and the, the, the great thing about a liberal arts education is you go to four years of college and you come out and you still don't know how anything works. So everything is kind of magical to me. Stuff that you probably understand, to me, seems, you know, like magic. Um, but stuff that seemed like science fiction not long ago is now in the world, or close to being in the world. And I'll tell you the one thing that I really wanted to see, the, the one thing here that I'm dying to see is this Bell Nexus, right? It's just like the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life, right? It's like science fiction has become real. Like the Jetsons and Blade Runner when we were kids is now, you know, pretty soon gonna be flying people from the airport into their meetings. I don't know if there's anybody here from Bell. Is anybody here from Bell? No. Anyway, I think those guys are the most amazing and insane people I've ever heard of. My twins are so jealous. They saw this, and they think I'm going to get to go for a ride on it, right? And I had to tell them, well, yeah, I am, totally. I'm going for a ride on that. With Beyonce is going to be here, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a VIP, so yeah, cool. Um, meanwhile, though, I cover Silicon Valley, right? And here's what they're doing, right? They got scooters, right? This is like their big innovation. It's a skateboard with a battery on the bottom. I'm like, how is this even tech? I said, I've been covering tech for a long time. And I look at this and I'm like, how is this even tech? And they're like, well, it has an app, you know? And like, you can pay in Bitcoin. Great, right? Um, so I guess I become kind of known as being a cynic in Silicon Valley and a critic of the business model of companies that never make money but go public anyway and everybody gets rich and then the whole thing collapses. Uh, I'm kind of waiting for them to just straight out produce an app that's just called Ponzi, you know, and it's literally a pyramid scheme, but it's on an app, and, you know, but it's, it's openly about, it's a new kind of investing for a new kind of investor, you, you know, like it's, uh, you know, because um, I think that's what all they got left at this point. Um, I also think we're at this amazing inflection point where the drone market is going to triple in the next five years, according to Drone Industry Insights, where a whole new industry that didn't even exist 10 years ago, and which to me is still totally amazing, right, is becoming a real thing that companies use, a multi-billion dollar industry. And more exciting is that companies keep inventing new ways to use them. Uh, Michael Chasen from Precision Hawk is going to be up next, and I was just backstage talking to him about this, that it's amazing to me the way they just keep coming up with things to do with drones that they couldn't have imagined a year or two years ago. Um, which is, oh, I missed a slide. Oh, this one, sorry, the fourth industrial revolution. So we're at the beginning or just the very dawn of this time in history where we are really, really going to see civilization change in big ways and not just drones and not just Bell Nexus helicopters but everything, 
right? We're going to have uh, we're going to have new industries. We're going to have new business models, new economies. Uh, we're going to have capitalism itself may actually change in the uh, in the next few decades. And it's funny that when you look for stock art to say fourth industrial revolution, you always get very scary images like this one. This is sort of a a riff on the you know the Michelangelo creation of Adam, is that it? where God is touching. Adam's finger, right? Only in this case, and interestingly enough, the robot is God, right? Man is still man. Um, but the, the, the artwork is all kind of scary, like it's robots, it's cyborgs. Um, we're here talking about the power of autonomy. And what I kind of want to talk about is the power of humans. I like to talk about the, the interface, the point where those two fingers are meeting, right? Like how those two worlds of smart machines and what I think of as stupid humans, where we're going to meet, how will we coexist? And specifically, I think a lot about it in terms of the workplace. Um, so you have the, the required slide is why listen to me, right? Because I'm an idiot. I write comedy on TV, right? I wrote on this show, which is essentially, if you haven't seen it, it's about five morons who are trying to get rich in Silicon Valley and failing, right? That's essentially the show. Um, but. I've also been writing about technology for a long time, and in the last few years, I've become really interested in the workplace. And it, for personal reasons, uh, my own career has kind of gone in a lot of wacky directions since I turned 50. And I wrote two books about the workplace that came out in the last three years. So the first one is a funny book. It's called Disrupted. And it's essentially a story of me going to work in a startup run by millennials and it turns out to be kind of a cross between a frat house, a Montessori kindergarten, and a Scientology cult compound, right? All rolled into one. And I'm just me, cynical journalist guy, and it doesn't go well. This is just a bit. Uh, the next book, which just came out recently, is called Lab Rats. And it's essentially a book about how technology is reshaping work across all industries, uh, and how work is changing in what we might call the new economy. Um, and in Lab Rats, I set out with basically one big question to answer, which a, a one bit of cognitive dissonance based on two things that didn't seem to go together. The one thing was, we live in this age of miracles and wonder and amazing automation and machines and the internet. The other thing is people are more miserable than ever before, right? There are countless studies that show in the workplace uh, anxiety, stress, and depression are all on the rise. Um, engagement is stuck in a rut. HR departments have been trying for 20 years to somehow boost engagement, and they can't make the needle move at all. Um, and those two things don't seem to make sense, right? I mean, in the late 90s, when we were at the beginning of the internet, all the projections were about utopia. We were all going to be rich. We were going to have ultra prosperity. We were going to have free time. Work was going to be more democratized. Politics was going to be better because we'd all be so well informed. Um, and so we live in this age of miracles, and yet the misery index has gone up. So what I set out to do is say, why? Right? Why did that happen? And I spent a year just traveling around the world and going to conferences and interviewing psychologists and sociologists and anthropologists. I went to Steelcase. Steelcase, the furniture maker, also has a huge research department full of anthropologists who study how people work. And it's a fascinating, fascinating place. I visited startups in Silicon Valley. I visited big companies. And I came up with a handful of things that are in the book that I think are the cause of the misery and then a handful of solutions. And I, I want to just talk about one of them today. And that one has to do with technology. And it's not really technology. It's, um, it's, it's what we do with it. It's like how we implement technology, how we build that interface, or how we haven't thought about that interface between the two worlds, how we manage that interface, I think is a big cause of this unhappiness and very, very easy to fix. right? So right now, this is what we have, right? Uh, this is the two communities, right? And if you look at Jimmy Fallon's face here, he looks like he lost a bet, right? And the WD-40 is a very nice touch that you don't see at first. But anyway, um, 
right? Yeah, I know. Oh, God. It's disgusting. Um, but I think this is kind of how a lot of us feel about new technology, even maybe some of us who work in new technology, right? There's this sort of sense in the collective unconscious across our culture about AI and about robotics that is scary, that this is something to dread, right? Now, I could tell you amazing, great stories about AI. I have a friend who's a scientist. He's a researcher in, in uh, pharmaceuticals and biotech. He also does AI. He's working on a product that basically sifts through genetic data to diagnose rare, uh, rare genetic diseases in newborn babies in really, really record time. And so it's saving lives because these kids are born and they're racing against the clock. And simply because of AI, because it can power through a huge amount of data in less time, kids' lives are being saved. But that's not the story we're told about AI. That's not how people perceive AI, right? And think about how it is. And I bet you exactly know exactly what the main story is about AI. I did an experiment where I went to Google. You can do this yourself. And I typed in, will robots? And I wanted to see what would autocomplete come up with. Look at that. Right? That's what people are looking at. That's the collective unconscious. Right? Right? It's going to put us all out of jobs. I can't tell you how many stories I've read about, like, Will it take all our jobs? Which jobs will it take? Which jobs are at risk, right? What are we going to do when none of us have jobs, right? So I think one thing we need to do is acknowledge that fear. So as we're rolling out automation in the workplace, into our workflows, um, as we're using intelligent machines, recognize that the people who are using them are afraid of them. And then try to acknowledge and overcome that fear, right? And then also, I really think we have to reframe the story. I know it's not the vendor's fault. I, don't know, I guess it's just the media runs with this. But the real story is not who's going to get put out of work or how many will be put out of work. To me, the real story is what about those of us who don't get out, put out of work, who keep our jobs, but have to work alongside intelligent machines, right? Like, how we kind of coexist? What's that going to do to us as a species, right? Um, if you think about how we're adapting so far, and this is the human side of the equation, right? On the product side of the equation, you can think about it of that interface. You can fix the, the pro you can think about it in product design. You can deal with it in marketing, which is really where I think it takes place. But we also have to do stuff on the human side of the equation, right? And so far, humans aren't very good at adapting to technology, and we make different mistakes. This, this one that I'm going to show you is the opposite of the fear mistake. This is the overconfidence mistake. This is just a 10 second video that I'm going to run. And it's a person sound asleep in the back seat of their Tesla, right? Um, so here goes. Three dollars. All right, so that scares the hell out of me, right? Um, so that's like the, the guy who wants so badly to believe that this, the Tesla can drive itself that he just thinks it can, right? That because some technology in the future will be able to do something, we have this psychological ability to reel that back into the present and just believe it exists today, right? Another human issue that it brings up is our, our tendency to oversell technology. So for example, Tesla calls it's uh, driver assist technology, autopilot, right? Which, you know, causes some people to infer that the car has autopilot, right? Which it doesn't, right? And the same thing happens in organizations, the same kind of overconfidence. So I'll show you what I mean by that. A few years ago, Corn Ferry, the recruiting firm, did a survey of 800 CEOs, and they asked them, to list the five most important assets in their organization today and five years from now. What are the five most important things, the most crucial things for your success? And humans did not make the list. Like they weren't number five, they didn't even make the top five. Their, their emphasis was all on technology, specifically AI, robotics, automation, right? To the point where they think those technologies will make humans irrelevant to the future. And as you know in your organization, if the boss cares about something, you know, 
you find out. You don't even have to be told. If the boss doesn't care about something, you also know. So if the boss doesn't care about humans, the employees at these 800 companies know that, right? Which adds to their fear. Rather than alleviating their fear, it compounds their fear, right? And I would argue that those CEOs are sleeping in their Tesla. Right? They are believing that right now they can just plump all their, pump all their money into automation and just keep the humans as long as we have to, treat them badly, and just finally we'll get rid of them. Right? Another interesting phenomenon is that a new metaphor has emerged for the corporation itself, for the organization itself. And in, you know, hundreds of years ago, the, the dominant metaphor was that the human brain is a clock. Right? And God is the great timekeeper. God is the watchmaker. Right? But now, it's that the organization is a computer, right? So this is Ray Dalio. Ray Dalio runs Bridgewater Associates. It's the most successful hedge fund in the world. And he has essentially made a bet that says, uh, we use AI to pick stocks, so why don't we use AI to manage employees, to make decisions? And he's creating an AI CEO, right? This is also, I think, why, why agile implementations fail, because agile begins with this idea that the organization is a computer, the people are chips, we pump out a new software upgrade, the chips all reprogram themselves, and now we're agile. And of course, it doesn't work that way with humans, right? The dangerous aspect of this new metaphor is that the machine becomes central to the organization. It becomes the most important thing, and we just plug into it, right? We're like meat puppets on the end of an algorithm, right? Already today, people are hired by machines, they're monitored, they're measured, they're managed by machines, and they're fired by machines, right? Early in my career, I started working in the early days of the personal computer, and we had the idea, we went to work, we went to the office, and we used technology. Today, a lot of people go to work and feel that technology uses them. Um, and the effect of this is that people feel dehumanized, right? They're told your incentive, the way to succeed in this company, the way to, to, to adapt is to become as much like a robot as you can. Don't take bathroom breaks. Don't take lunch breaks. Um, do what the machine tells you, right? So in, instead of having technology adapt to us, we're told to adapt to it. So in Lab Rats, these are the things I was finding, but then I also found companies that were seeing, had already seen this way ahead of me and were trying to rehumanize a workplace that had become dehumanized, which basically means just putting human beings back at the center of the organization, putting them at number one on that list of most important assets, which, as some of you will know, if you remember a generation ago, again, when my career began, there was a cliche that our best assets walk out the door every night. That was, CEOs said that even if they didn't mean it, right? Now they don't bother even lying, right? So, how do you put humans back into the center of the organization? What a lot of companies do, and what I found in the startup world is, they go buy a ping pong table, right? And oddly enough, right, I, I especially with, talk to millennials. Millennials do not want ping pong, right? They don't want beer bashes, they don't want keggers, but you know what they do want? They want money, shockingly. They want to make enough money to buy a house, right? They want to be, feel relevant, they want to have some dignity. They basically want the same thing everybody else wants. So how do you do that? Three rules I'll give you. One, don't sleep in your Tesla. This is a real guy sleeping in his Tesla, right? Think about this. There are some things that humans still do better than machines. This is why this whole idea of believing automation can do everything right now is wrong. The stupidest person you know, think of that person. That person can drive a car, right? The smartest computer in the world cannot, right? Um, so keep some perspective on what machines can do, right? One of the best examples is Tesla itself. Elon Musk built this space-age robot factory called the Alien Dreadnought. And as soon as demand ramped up for the Model 3, the thing broke down. And he had to rip it out and replace robots with humans, at which point he said, the great quote, humans are underrated, which, yes, we are. You know, hooray for team humans, right? Um, I'm on our side. Like, as a species, look, we have to band together, right? It's us or the machines, right? Um, there's also a difference between can and should. There are some things that machines can do that they maybe should not do. So Harvard Business Review just had a great study by two doctoral candidates at Harvard who found that certain high anxiety transactions like financial services really, really suffer if you try to automate them, right? 
people really want to talk to people. Shockingly, human beings want to talk to human beings. And what they also found is an interesting footnote is you don't have to have a whole staff of humans. Just knowing that they can talk to a human, they don't have to deal with the self-service, alleviates the anxiety. I would argue that another example of this is HR. I can't stand the, with the way HR departments now roll out chatbots so that if I'm an employee and I have an, a question about my health benefits, I talk to a chatbot. I don't want to talk to a chatbot. I want to talk to a human being. And this is a department that has the word human in its name, right? I mean, it's human resources, right? Um, item number two. Humans can't change as fast as machines can, and they can't change as fast as we want them to. While doing lab rats, I came across countless studies about what change does to human brains. And it basically overwhelms the brain, and it just shuts down, right? Researchers have now been talking about this thing called the acceleration trap, where companies are trying to move so fast and do so much that they actually get trapped and they get nothing out of it. So they'll spend a lot of money on a change initiative and then get no benefit from it. And even though it seems counterintuitive, these two professors from Germany wrote in HBR that you should slow down. Slow down, make the change initiative work, have a period of stability afterwards, and then do the next change initiative. The problem is just that humans can't evolve at the speed of Moore's law, right? And if you want to operate with humans, you have to operate at human speed. Three, invest in your humans, um, right? The best way to, pay, to show people that they're the center of your organization is pretty simple. Like pay them better, provide them with benefits, don't make them contractors. But more importantly, invest in training and development and education. The best way to reduce that fear of automation, that fear of being replaced by robots, is to help people learn new skills and help them become better able to adapt. Right? In the course of doing this book, I thought, I want to find the companies with the happiest employees and then find out what they do and then figure out how to reverse engineer it. So I found an organization called Great Place to Work that makes the annual list for fortune of best places to work. And one thing they said was, it's not just about investing time, it's also, I mean, money, it's also investing time and attention, right? So these guys have been surveying employees for 20 plus years, hundreds, thousands of employees. And one great example they had is this. This is Hilton, this is the CEO of Hilton, Chris Nassetta, who has a rule that every year, for one week, his entire C-suite has to go work out in the field, either as a janitor or a housekeeper or work in a kitchen. Uh, just, just the front lines and the top lines have to work together, right? And they call this closing the gap. And Great Place to Work found that companies that do this produce three times as much revenue growth as companies that don't. Another really amazing thing that they found is they, they went through all of this mountain of data and they were trying to figure out, is there any way to correlate certain practices with employees with stock performance? So they found companies that had outperformed the market over 20 years, and then they sifted through the employee survey data to find keywords, and they found two. One was safe, people who felt safe at work, like emotionally or physically, and the other word was a sense of welcome, a phrase. A sense of welcome, people who felt welcomed at work, and where those two keywords showed up, those companies outperformed the market over 20 years, sometimes by up to 200%. So the point is that this isn't charity, right? This is, um, this is about providing a better service to your customers who are also, by the way, for now, humans, right? There's a great saying that your, your customers will never be any happier than your employees. So of course work is going to involve bringing in more automation, more machine intelligence. But paradoxically, in a world that's powered by AI, that's powered by automation, human skills may be the ultimate differentiator. We may be thinking, it, thinking of it all wrong. Instead of thinking that humans are irrelevant, the quality of our humans in, in our organization versus our competitors may be the one thing that gives us an edge. Things like creativity, serendipity, innovation. So to recap, right? Invest in your human, uh, don't sleep in your Tesla, right? Go at human speed and invest in your humans, right? Um, I think it's just about remembering why we do any of this in the first place, right? Why any of us got into business. It wasn't to make technology for technology's sake. It's, it's to make the world a better place, right? 
I said up front that the Bell Nexus was the coolest thing I'd ever seen, but this actually, I think, is cooler. And I'll explain what this is. This is a one-month-old baby in Vanuatu, this island in the South Pacific, right? And he's getting a vaccine, and the vaccine was delivered by drone, right? To an area, he's getting a hepatitis and a TB vaccine, to an area where they didn't have vaccines. 20% oh, of the kids don't get vaccines. This, this baby's mother would have had to work, walk 25 miles to see a nurse. The guys who did this are called Swoop Arrow. They're from Australia, and they're up for a humanitarian award on Thursday night. And the last thing I want to leave you with is just that. Please go to this. I was so excited when I saw not only is there amazing technology here, but there's an award for humanitarian purposes. To me, that grounds the whole thing. I mean, you have people who are nominated for this award who are delivering vaccines, doing search and rescue for at-risk people. You have, uh, there's a team that's using drones to try to clean up the ocean by spotting plastic in the ocean, right? So the point is this technology isn't really about replacing humans, it's about helping humans, you know? My kids who are 13 ask me what kids that age do, like what should I do when I grow up? And I, and I keep telling them, you can't even plan. Because whatever you're gonna do when you grow up is something that doesn't exist now. But you are living in the most exciting century in all of human history. You're gonna get to not only see it, you have a chance to build it. Right? If you imagine where we were 10 years ago, then try to imagine where we're going to be in 10 or in the year 2050. It's almost unfathomable. I actually think you guys are also the luckiest people in the world because you guys are the ones who get to build it. Unlike me, I just get to see it. You guys get to have a role in this. I hope you will remember as you do that it is a way to make the world a better place, but that is not just about your customers. It begins with your own employees. Anyway, thank you for giving me the chance to be here and to talk to you. And thank you very much, sincerely, for the work you all do. Thank you.